I will um, uh, ask to talk a little bit about uh, incentivizing climate smart agriculture, and um, everybody knows this is now three elements. Uh, it's to do with trying to increase production sustainably. Uh, it's uh, to try to build resilience and, and to help the, uh, the sector adapt to climate change, and it's also uh, to do with mitigating uh, carbon emissions. Now, for those of you who are here uh, hoping that I might say something about adaptation today, I'm afraid uh, you'll be disappointed. Um, uh, it's an important issue, but uh, we simply don't have time. So I really want to focus on the first and the third, and, and the potential contradiction or conflict there may be, particularly for us in Ireland, between these two objectives, increasing uh, food production and at the same time uh, trying to reduce uh, uh, carbon uh, emissions. Um, and I think it's a very complex issue. I'm not sure I have any easy answers, but hopefully at least as we think through it, we can try to, to come up with a, a sort of a, a framing of, of, of the problem. I have a little slide there with a picture of a cow. Uh, she's very happy uh, because she's doing uh, what she does best, which is producing nutritious food, milk and meat for uh, the human uh, population. The only difficulty is that she's also producing as a joint product uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And this is something which farmers for millennia never really uh, thought about, uh, but which is now uh, increasingly uh, brought home to us because of the growing concern about the uh, social uh, uh, and environmental costs of, um, uh, of uh, the human contribution to, uh, to, to, to climate change. And the thing about these greenhouse gas emissions, in economic terms, they're an externality, uh, a negative externality. Uh, that means they're, they're, they're not priced, but they have particular um, characteristics which make them, I think, very unusual. Um, first of all, it's an invisible externality. We don't really see it. You know, we produce the milk, uh, we produce the, 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 the meat, but we don't really see uh, these greenhouse gases. Uh, secondly, it's a long-term externality. We don't see any immediate uh, 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 change in our environment uh, as we continue with our milking and our meat production. Uh, it, it's something which happens over a long period of time. The effects are not necessarily local. The, the main effects may indeed be far away, uh, particularly, let's say, in developing countries. Uh, we in Ireland may be relatively, uh, uh, relatively uh, unaffected. And it's a global problem, which gives rise to a, a collective action issue. In other words, uh, Ireland on its own, to take action on this issue, is going to have a minuscule effect on the overall outcome. And yet, if we all sit back and take that attitude, nothing happens. So contrast those four characteristics of this particular externality with another externality, very familiar to those of you uh, working in agriculture, which is water pollution. Totally different. If a farmer pollutes a stream at the end of his field, it's local, he sees the problem, it's immediate, and his neighbors kick up about it. So we've, we're dealing with a fundamentally different type of externality, both in scale and in design or, 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 or character. And that makes it very difficult, I think, uh, for, 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 to, to get our heads around it. And Pat Bogue did a, a very interesting report for the National Rural Network a year or two ago where he interviewed farmers and, you know, the, they didn't really understand what the problem was. And I, I must say I, that, that doesn't surprise me. Um, uh, so we, we are dealing with an issue which is, which is complex, which is new, um, uh, and uh, to which I think there are uh, no, easy, no easy answers. But I want to stress that these emissions are a real cost. It's not just a sort of a bookkeeping uh, exercise. They are a real cost. And therefore placing, and this would be the sort of fundamental uh, sort of message that I would have, is that placing a value on this emitted carbon, a cost, a price, whatever you want to call it, is important to ensure that effective incentives are in place uh, in order to tackle climate change. Now, where does that price, uh, that cost, come from? Uh, we can think of it as, let's say, what's called, sometimes called the social cost of carbon. That is to say, we can think of it as the, the damages caused, the value of the damages caused by emitting one extra unit, one extra ton of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Um, and you can have very complex models with lots of assumptions to try to come up with that particular figure. 
Perhaps more concretely, you can think of it simply as the carbon price, or what Convery and Clinch some years ago called the avoided cost of compliance. In other words, it's simply uh, the, 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 the cost to the state of avoiding the, 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 the last unit of emissions in order to, to meet with its, uh, its compliance uh, targets, with, in our case, with our uh, international uh, uh, commitments. And of course, those commitments come because of uh, our membership of the, the, the European Union. And essentially, the EU has two sets of targets. That is, targets, everybody knows this, uh, for the, um, uh, the emissions trading uh, system sector, which is essentially energy and large industry. And then it has uh, individual national targets. With the, the, the ETS target is now a, a unified EU-wide target. It has national targets then for the so-called non-ETS uh, sectors. Now, these are uh, largely agriculture, transport, uh, housing, uh, waste, uh, small industry, uh, and so on. And as I say, the important thing here is that these are national uh, targets. So effectively, just there alone, we have 29 different targets. Uh, we have 28 national ones and, and, and one for the EU as a whole. And of course, the more constraints that you have, the more individual targets you have to meet, the more likely it is that you're not going to hit the efficient uh, uh, least cost uh, way of reducing emissions because, in a sense, you're probably likely to find that one country is finding it more expensive uh, to meet its emission reductions than another uh, because the, 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 the targets have not been set in a way which equalizes that marginal uh, abatement cost uh, across countries. At this point in time, 2015, we're faced with two sets of targets. We have a set of targets for, the, for 2020, uh, where the Irish target is a 20% reduction in these non-ETS emissions compared to 2005. This is relatively much higher than for the uh, European Union as a whole, where the uh, target reduction was 10%. And there are certain flexibilities built in. So we don't have to meet uh, th that reduction entirely through domestic reductions. Uh, we can use um, uh, international uh, offsets, we can purchase uh, or, or, or transfer emission uh, um, allowances from other member states. Um, uh, and an important point that the, the so-called land use, land use change in forestry sector uh, is not uh, taken into account uh, in this particular uh, period. Turning then to the 2030 targets, which uh, I think we need to start to focus on at this stage, um, uh, so this is page two, if you like, of the, if you look at the bottom, if you're looking for the, uh, uh, the, the handout. Um, here we have the conclusions of the European Council meeting, a 30% overall uh, reduction in um, uh, non-ETS sector uh, emissions. Uh, national targets yet to be decided, but will range between 0%, uh, 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 no reduction, to minus 40%. Uh, which will uh, essentially be linked to your relative GDP with some qualifications. So Ireland, as a high uh, GDP per capita country, might expect on that basis to have uh, an emissions reduction target greater than 30%. On the other hand, in the European Council conclusions, uh, due uh, not least to, to very effective uh, negotiations uh, by the Irish um, uh, delegation, uh, there is a recognition uh, that, um, uh, that the question of food security and agriculture needs to, 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 to be given careful uh, consideration and should be taken into account in setting uh, whatever targets uh, are, are, uh, come, come about. So there is, uh, on that basis, given that uh, of all member states, we by far have the highest dependence on uh, agricultural uh, emissions, uh, as part of our non-ETS total, uh, that could mean a, a somewhat lower reduction commitment than 30%. But that all remains to, to, to be decided. There will again be some flexibilities. Uh, all of that reduction has to come about this, uh, this time uh, from domestic uh, uh, reductions. There's no possibility of international um, uh, purchases, but there will be maybe enhanced uh, uh, possibilities to, to exchange or, or, or transfer uh, allowances between member states. Um, there is an interesting sort of possibility just mooted that uh, there may be some link between the non-TS and the ETS uh, uh, sector. And uh, there is a commitment to look at how the land use, land use change and forestry sector can be integrated into the, uh, the target process. I just note that in addition to these climate targets, there is a parallel process going on 
uh, under the Clean Air uh, Programme, uh, which is going to revise the national emission ceilings for other uh, um, um, uh, gases um, and, and pollutants. Uh, in particular, uh, of concern or of interest to, to agriculture are the ammonia uh, ceilings and, and the possibility that methane, there could be a separate target for methane gas, which of course is a large part of our agricultural emissions, under the Clean Air Act, quite separate from any uh, implicit target on methane that might be there from our uh, non-ETS uh, uh, ceiling. However, that legislation is still uh, uh, going through the, um, the, uh, the legislative process in, in, in Europe, so we, we don't yet know what the, the, the outcome will be. If we look at um, estimates of the sort of social cost of carbon, I mean, how, how damaging really is it? And there are, in the, in the international literature, many attempts at trying to, to estimate it. The uh, United States has just come up with a, a huge uh, uh, report uh, where it has uh, done it. But I, I've just quoted here the UK uh, guidelines. Uh, they suggest to take into account in, 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 in sort of policy uh, analysis uh, for uh, 2010. Uh, for the ETS sector, it's 14 pounds sterling per tonne of carbon dioxide. Um, uh, for the non-ETS sector, even at the moment, uh, they reckon that uh, carbon is costing 52, ton, uh, 52 uh, pounds uh, uh, per tonne. And they expect, uh, so that's an indication of the fact that you have different marginal abatement costs in the two uh, sectors with different, uh, different ceilings. Um, uh, uh, but they expect these to converge, uh, and by 2050, they expect... Uh, the cost of carbon to be equivalent of 200 uh, pounds sterling uh, per tonne. Now, in the latest uh, EPA uh, uh, projections, uh, they are using as an assumption a cost of carbon of 20 euro per tonne in 2020, rising to 57 euro per tonne in uh, 2035, which is the end year. So, not only uh, are we jointly producing carbon gases with our meat and our milk, but the cost of that externality is going to rise, according to these forecasts, quite significantly over time. And that's the challenge that, 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 that we face. Um, in the next slide, and you can't really see the figures, I'm afraid, uh, but I try to put, do a back-of-the-envelope calculation in terms of if we, uh, if we attribute um, uh, the carbon emissions to uh, a litre of milk or to a kilogram of meat, um, and use these EPA estimates, what would it mean in terms of the charge that a farmer might face? And in the case of milk, with the 20 uh, uh, euro per, per, per tonne uh, carbon uh, cost, um, it would lead to an extra uh, charge of about 6.5% on the current price of milk. In other words, about 2 cents uh, compared to a, a milk price of, of, let's say, 31 cents. Um, and in the case of meat, um, uh, it would be a higher charge, it would be over 10%, uh, so you'd be talking about uh, almost half a euro compared to a meat price of four, uh, 420 uh, euro per kilo. Of course, if we move forward to 2035, which is only 20 years uh, ahead, um, uh, the, the, the cost of those emissions rises significantly. Uh, uh, up to about 18% of the, uh, of the milk price, assuming no, no change in milk prices over the, the period, uh, and up to 30% of, the, uh, of the, the cost of meat. So that's the scale of the challenge. I'm not saying that uh, that's the, the, the level of carbon cost which necessarily, um, uh, I mean, there may be arguments for, for, uh, for uh, ameliorating that, reducing it or whatever, but that is, if we were to fully cost uh, 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 these, these carbon emissions, that is the implications uh, that we face. Now, of course, the agricultural industry makes some good arguments um, that, uh, they, that this should not, um, uh, in a sense, uh, come about. Uh, they argue that Ireland relatively is a, 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 an efficient uh, uh, producer of meat and milk in carbon terms which is true, uh, but that doesn't necessarily make us a low-carbon uh, uh, agriculture. We're, we're a high-carbon agriculture, in fact, the highest in Europe after, um, Denmark, after uh, the Netherlands and, um, and Belgium. Um, 
If we were to restrict Irish uh, production, uh, this obviously uh, flies in face of the, the other imperative that we should be increasing production in the face of uh, increasing world food demand. Um, if we restrict Irish production, the argument is that uh, it would simply lead to production moving to, to other countries, which are uh, less likely to be less carbon efficient than we are, meaning that there would be an overall increase in global emissions, which is certainly not what uh, the policy is uh, intended to produce. Um, and it's also argued that abatement with respect to biological emissions is difficult, which it is, um, and therefore we should really focus on a target such as reducing emissions intensity rather than an absolute uh, target of, 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 of reducing absolute emissions. Now, I think that there are, uh, uh, some of these arguments are stronger than others, but there's certainly uh, a lot in them. And I think they're very important arguments to be made around the table when we are deciding on what the overall level of this, uh, what the overall um, uh, ceiling for our non-ETS sector is going to be in 2030. In other words, if it is more difficult uh, to reduce biological emissions, and if we have a high share of those emissions, then obviously our uh, ceiling should be more lenient than in the case of a country whose emissions are largely in the energy sector or, 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 or whatever. But I would argue that once that ceiling is set, once we have a national ceiling, which implies that if we exceed it, there is a cost, a real cost, not a bookkeeping cost, not something that's theoretical or artificial. There's a real cost to the economy of meeting that ceiling because we have to go out and use these flexibility mechanisms to purchase uh, sufficient allowances to bring ourselves into compliance. And, you know, if in 20, 2035 these, these uh, allowances are costing 57 uh, euro per ton, um, that's going to add up to a lot of, uh, a lot of revenue uh, leaving, leaving the country. Um, so I would argue that once the once the target is, 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 is established, we then have to ask how, what is the best way that we, as a country, meet uh, that particular uh, target. Now, it is true that agricultural emissions have been trending down. That's what the next chart uh, uh, shows you. And if you turn the page to page three, you'll see that that's largely because over the past quarter century, we have seen no increase in agricultural output in Ireland. Uh, that in itself is an interesting story. There's been a huge amount of money put into research, uh, into, into support for the sector, yet uh, in, in, in 2015 we produced exactly the same amount that we produced in 1990. But from a greenhouse gas emissions uh, perspective, that was very good because, of course, we did have productivity improvement. So we were producing that with less cows, less nitrogen, and therefore less emissions. But we now have uh, 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 food Harvest 2020, which suggests that we are going to increase production quite significantly in the coming years. And there's another group, Food Harvest 2025, which I think is going to set uh, uh, further uh, targets beyond 2020. And there is a reason why we would expect in production to increase, because uh, for, for the first time since 1984, milk quotas will, will, will have gone uh, uh, this year. And we know that dairying is by far the most dynamic sector within the, within the agricultural sector. So there is indeed potential uh, to grow. But that, of course, does create the dilemma that it also means increased uh, emissions. So if you look at the EPA projections um, uh, to, to 2035, agriculture today is about 45%. They expect agriculture to remain about 45%. So we've got half of the emissions in the non-ETS uh, sector. The next slide then shows the EPA's projection as to what emissions in that sector are going to be. And you can see that they're basically going to stay flat. Without additional uh, interventions, uh, the EPA expects uh, that we will be producing roughly the same level of emissions in 2035 as we are uh, today. But remember, we are going to face a reduction target. We don't know what that reduction target is going to be yet, but let's assume that it's around 30%. So in other words, what the average of the European Union as a whole, and I show what that would mean in the dotted line there, and you can see that 
the overall e uh, non-ETS sector would have to reduce uh, emissions uh, quite considerably. And as I say, agriculture is half of that. So if you say uh, that um, uh, we're going to, in a sense, um, I'm not suggesting that agriculture isn't going to make a contribution. It, it is, of course. But the question is, do we need to ask it to do or incentivize it to do, to do more? And that's really what the rest of the, uh, the talk is. How am I doing? I'm going on for a little bit of time. Am I? It, yeah. So just in responses, essentially there are three sort of groups of responses. We can, of course, try to reduce emissions uh, by reducing emissions intensity or by shifting uh, uh, output to less intensive uh, uh, products. We can try to increase the sequestration of carbon in the soil or in forests, or we can try to uh, uh, produce bioenergy, which helps to uh, avoid uh, emissions uh, elsewhere. And the way in which um, we tend to look at this is by constructing a sort of marginal abatement cost curve. In other words, ranking the various options according to their uh, cost uh, effectiveness. And uh, Chagas have, have, have done this, uh, focusing mainly on, on sort of agricultural uh, um, uh, abatement options. In other words, not land use, uh, land use change and forestry uh, options. And um, I, I, at the bottom of that page three, I sort of illustrate what this MAC curve looks like. So um, this is a sort of a, a, a hypothetical example, but you can see at the bottom left, these are abatement options which are win-win. Essentially, they help us both to reduce uh, emissions, but also to increase uh, uh, profit and productivity at farm level. So these are, these are highly uh, desirable uh, 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 options to pursue. You then have options which are sort of cost neutral. You then have options which are cost effective, meaning that they, they, they do cost uh, the sector something to uh, implement them, but nonetheless that cost is less than this uh, uh, carbon price uh, which, uh, which, which we have set. And then there are those options which clearly are uneconomic to pursue, where the cost of reducing emissions is just simply too, uh, too high. And the Chagas curve for agriculture is shown at the top of page four. And um, you can see that there uh, seems to be a large uh, potential for these win-win options. Um, and they come about through extended grazing, through uh, improved breeding. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, we could abate emissions by 5 to 7 percent. Uh, if uh, all of those options uh, were taken up. And of course, it just raises the question, given that they would also increase farm profit at the moment, why is it that uh, that isn't happening? Um, the next set of options um, are essentially bioenergy options, uh, which come in showing uh, sort of uh, uh, roughly cost-neutral terms, and, and really there isn't much, uh, much, much else. And just to say a little word about the bioenergy, because of course here... Um, it depends on the use of that bioenergy. If you're simply substituting for electricity, for example, through co-firing co in a peat power uh, station, then uh, you're not actually reducing agricultural emissions. You're simply reducing uh, the demand for allowances in the ETS system. So actually, it doesn't help you in meeting your non-ETS uh, target. However, if you are supplying your biomass, say, for uh, home heating or to a hospital for, 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 uh, for a heating scheme, um, and uh, as a result, they're reducing their fossil fuel use, uh, then, okay, you don't benefit agriculture directly, but you are uh, uh, reducing the demand for, uh, if you like, emission credits uh, within the, uh, the non-ETS sector. So that certainly helps agriculture because it, it provides more scope for, uh, for agricultural emissions if households, if hospitals and, and so on uh, are, are, uh, are burning uh, by bioenergy. But there are the, uh, problems or, or, or arguments around this about, about is it right to, to use agricultural resources for energy instead of food? Uh, are they really reducing emissions if we take the indirect land use change into effect and so on? Then carbon sequestration, um, uh, again, in terms of soils, uh, potentially uh, this would seem um, uh, uh, a very uh, possible source, but huge issues in terms of measurement and, and verifying uh, 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 the uptake of, of carbon. So I, I, I'm not sure I see uh, soils coming in, but certainly forestry uh, is, is something which 
uh, potentially uh, could, uh, could contribute to, to, to helping us meet our targets. And we have to wait and see what the Commission is going to propose as to how they're going to integrate those into the targets. But if you look at the uh, McKinsey uh, uh, MAC curve, which was f f looking at land use and carbon sinks, they do suggest that we could uh, uh, reduce emissions you know, at a cost-effective uh, rate through uh, afforestation. <coughs> So the question is how to incentivize uh, these changes. There are obviously some possibilities for reducing um, uh, emissions, but how to actually incentivize them. And here the Climate Action and Low Carbon uh, Development Bill emphasizes that measures should be cost effective um, and uh, at the least cost to the national economy. So that's, if you like, uh, the, the perspective that I'm uh, addressing. If you look internationally, what are other countries doing? Um, obviously, all countries are, are trying to uh, pursue the voluntary route. I mean, all countries have these win-win options. So if you could only get farmers to adopt uh, uh, measures which should prove their own productivity, at the same time, you can reduce emissions. Some countries have gone further where they have a compliance scheme in operation. They have linked agriculture to that. Agriculture is not part of it, but they have allowed a sort of domestic offsetting uh, system. So in other words, uh, in Australia, in Canada, um, in, in California, uh, power companies, uh, if they find it cheaper uh, to pay farmers uh, to sequester carbon in their, in their soil, mainly tillage farmers, uh, if it's cheaper to do that than to actually uh, change your own system, uh, you're allowed to use those offsets. Only one country, uh, that's New Zealand, has actually gone further and actually attempt, at least considered uh, putting a price on carbon. This is the top of page five. Um, uh, uh, so they had decided to include agriculture in their uh, cap and trade emissions trading scheme, but two years ago uh, they backed away from that uh, arguing that other countries uh, uh, weren't doing it, was going to put their agriculture at a disadvantage, uh, so they would simply wait. Now, that might suggest that we would be well advised to do the same thing, but I would point out that in Ireland we do have a, a, a real binding commitment, a financial commitment. If we don't meet our targets, we have to buy those emission uh, units somewhere else. That's a real cost to the economy. New Zealand can make uh, uh, commitments, but if it doesn't meet them, there's really no sanction. So in a sense, it has more uh, freedom for maneuver than, than, than we do. Now, clearly, there are some possibilities under the recent cap. Um, uh, the changes, uh, many of you will be familiar with Pillar 1 and Pillar 2, the greening payment in Pillar 1. Uh, the new rural development program uh, in Pillar 2, and there are a number of measures in that which may help to reduce agricultural emissions. Frankly, I would be a little bit disappointed at the scale of these measures, and I'm, I'm not sure that they're really going to have any, uh, any, any really major uh, impact, but we can discuss that. What I want to focus on just, and this is the final point, Chair, sure, you'll be pleased to, to hear, is, is, is the competing incentives affecting uh, land use. Because essentially returns to agriculture, to forestry, and to bioenergy are all, in Ireland, very influenced by public policy interventions. And they don't always work in the same direction. In fact, very often they have, they have contradicted and competed uh, with each other. So we clearly have huge uh, uh, transfers uh, into, into the use of land for agriculture. Um, uh, the single farm payment, now the basic uh, uh, farm payment, uh, the less favored area payments, agri-environment schemes, and so on. So clearly, that, in a sense, incentivizes, it, it gives a preferential treatment to using land for agriculture rather than, for example, uh, for forestry. Now, when uh, Europe decoupled uh, the farm payments, there was a huge boost for forestry because, again, good skillful negotiation by, uh, by the Irish Department got the idea of the stacking of entitlements. In other words, it allowed farmers who wanted to a forest essentially to hold on to their uh, single farm payment. And that uh, uh, has been continued under the, uh, the new uh, basic farm payment scheme. So, in a sense, forestry is now, from that point of view, on a level uh, uh, playing field. It's, there's still some discrimination against forestry in the, in, in, in the, um, uh, the new less favoured area scheme uh, and so on, but, but, but much smaller. Um, so, the, the, in fact, it was a huge uh, switch, if you like, to support uh, forestry as a result of that possibility that what was previously purely an agricultural payment 
could now also be uh, 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 received by people who wanted to forest their land. Uh, of course, this incentive structure could change. Nobody really knows what will happen uh, to the CAP budget or to the design of CAP payments after 2020, and so on. But the importance of these payments is, is really highlighted, and I've, I've, cho I've picked the, the two uh, cattle systems uh, to show this, which is really just to, to indicate how these payments are underpinning the continuation of agricultural production. Let's just look, look at one of them, which is the single suckling enterprise, the first of the two slides, where the Chagas figures, they break this down between the most profitable uh, third, the, the, the sort of average profitable, and, 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 and the, the least profitable third. And if you look at the, the net margin figure, for the, for the uh, single suckling uh, enterprise as a whole, uh, this is negative. Uh, the, 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 the most profitable group have a small uh, uh, positive net margin, uh, but the least profitable uh, essentially are losing 250 euro per hectare. Uh, uh, um, you know, on, it's not on every animal, it's, it's, it's per hectare, but simply by being in that enterprise. And the only reason, of course, that they can continue is because they have this, uh, this direct payment, which uh, I've, 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 if you add them all up together in, the, in, in that enterprise, it works out at around 400 uh, 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 euro uh, per hectare. Um, so we see here subsidies, in a sense, maintaining uh, a, a sector which, if you were to add in the additional costs of the greenhouse gases, of course, those net margins would be even more negative. So it really makes you wonder, uh, 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 is that not a, a sort of a cheap abatement uh, option uh, at, 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 at low cost? If you look at the forestry figures, uh, the last slide on that table, uh, the, the, the work that has been done suggests that um, uh, there is a positive return if farmers switch land out of uh, uh, dry stock and other agricultural enterprises into forestry. And yet, if you turn the page to, 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 to uh, page six, you'll see that actually uh, forestry planting has been falling. Even despite, as I say, what should have been a significant boost after 2005, uh, we see uh, planting rates uh, coming down. Now, partly, of course, it was the Celtic tiger period. People expected land values to go up. There's all kinds of explanations. But the fact of the matter is that we, we, we aren't seeing the rates of afforestation, which, might be which are necessary to help us uh, uh, meet our targets. And that's not because forestry doesn't receive very significant subsidies. So the next slide, I've just tried to look at the cost of sequestering a, a, a ton of uh, CO2 through forestry. And if we assume that all of the, the current grants, the establishment grant, the maintenance grant, and the premium, are actually justified because of the carbon sequestration element. And it depends on the discount rate you use, because obviously forestry is a long-term enterprise. Um, but if you use a discount rate of 2%, which is, which is, is perhaps a, a lowish rate, um, you can see that the, the, we can sequester a, a ton of carbon in forestry by about, about 28 euro per ton, a little bit more than the sort of 20 euro. But given the uncertainties around this figure, I wouldn't like to, 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 to stand over. So uh, it does seem to me that the forestry incentive is about right, but of course it has to compete against the fact that uh, uh, it, the, the, the competition for that land use, namely the dry stock sector, is not being fully charged the full cost of, 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 of its production. Um, so so, 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 so there, is a, there is an imbalance there. And that's my conclusion, uh, uh, Tom, that I'm certainly not arguing, uh, and it's, it's sort of facile to say that because agricultural output also produces agricultural, greenhouse gas emissions, we should somehow stop uh, producing. Uh, I mean, that's not the, that's not the argument. Uh, but it's rather that any sector, if it has an external cost, those costs should also be taken into account in the decision whether to stay in or to increase uh, output uh, in that sector. Other, uh, uh, the other sectors in this non-ETS sector, the home heating, uh, the fuel transport, already pay a carbon tax. As I say, the, the sequestration uh, sector forestry already receives uh, uh, what I think is an adequate, maybe more than adequate, uh, 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 subsidy for its uh, carbon uh, contribution. But essentially, the livestock sector isn't 
uh, 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 facing those those uh, those charges, and 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 that in a sense is, is is going to make meeting our target not only more difficult but also in a sense more costly because it's going to either put a greater pressure on the other sectors, uh, the transport, uh, home heating uh, uh, sectors, and so on in the non-ETS sector or we're going to have to go out and, uh, and buy those, uh, which is a cost to the National Exchequer, even though, in a sense, uh, the beneficiaries are just uh, one group. Of course, there are valid arguments. What about jobs? What about carbon leakage? I think the jobs argument is, 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 is not a convincing one, because essentially a carbon tax what we're doing is we are reallocating uh, 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 resources between sectors within our economy. And if we, if we don't do that, we're actually paying money out of the country uh, to buy these emissions. So I, think we're, we, I don't think you could make a case that we would be uh, worse off on a jobs front uh, with, with uh, extending uh, the carbon tax. The carbon leakage argument, I think, is a much more difficult one to address. Because clearly, if Irish agriculture is the only agriculture, not only in Europe, but in the world, uh, which is being asked to bear the full cost of its uh, carbon emissions, and nobody else is, that's a very on-level playing field. But it seems to me that if we were to, as a, as, a, as a country, we were to agree that that's the right way forward, that ultimately consumers should pay the full cost of the food they, they produce, and that means paying for, the, for, the, for this carbon cost embodied uh, in it. If we were to decide that's the right way to go, it seems to me our, our negotiating strategy in Brussels would be different. Uh, we would now be trying to get all the other, uh, to, to get this generalized across Europe so that we weren't out on our own, so that we weren't an outlier and facing this on-level uh, playing field. So it seems to me that, uh, it, it, by, by, in a sense, by putting ourselves in a frame of mind as to the, the right direction to go, we could actually try to, uh, uh, and maybe successfully try to mitigate some of the more uh, obvious uh, disadvantages in terms of uh, competitiveness. So let me stop here and apologize for going on far too long. <laughs>